Welcome everyone, and um, there's a little more backstory there because my husband Randy is the least musical guy you would ever meet, so he's playing air guitar in this picture, and if I had known I was going to use it, of course I would have posed him, this was at Woody's house, and I would have posed him in front of Cactus, but when I put this together for Mid-States last summer, it just seemed like the perfect title slide for this. Okay, you're probably wondering why the heck did they ask a rock gardener to come to a cactus convention and talk about rock gardening? No, okay, nobody's admitting it, but I'm sure that's the first thought that you had. But the reason that we're doing this is because we're seeing a trend in our area and our, uh, one, our president of the Rock Garden Society National is here today and she said she's seeing it in lots of areas in the country where we're getting real and there she is we're getting a lot of crossover between these two organizations when randy and i moved to colorado 30 years ago at that time we had the daylily society the iris society the cactus and succulent society the rock and you name it we probably have 20 different plant societies and there was no cross-pollination between these groups whatsoever. They were very proud in their stubbornness of not growing anything in their gardens but daylilies, for example. And they would be set out like crops in rows. But that's changing. And thankfully it's changing. So we're in a position now where in Colorado, we, a lot of our most active members are active in both the Rock Garden Society and the Cactus and Succulent Society. And I would say that's happened in the last 10 years or so. And I want to explain to you what's going on. So some of you have heard of Jeff and Marie Thompson, I'm sure. He's one of our best cactus growers in Colorado and Pueblo. And I think he would consider this a cactus garden. This is Mike Kinchin from Denver Botanic Gardens. And I think he would consider this a rock garden. Well, what's the difference? They both contain about equal numbers of herbaceous plants and cactus and succulents. I think it's just a matter of what you decide to call it because these are both very and extremely similar gardens. So what's happening here? Well, I thought it would help if we just went through and looked at some of the things that rock gardeners have always done traditionally. Rock gardening is little over a hundred years old as a hobby and started in England primarily when the plant collectors started looking through the world for plants and the English had to figure out how to grow these things and they built gardens particularly for them. So I'm going to go through each of these things and talk about how they apply to our gardens. This is Paniotti Calides. I'm sure many of you have heard him talk. And this is his rock alpine garden at his home. And this is a traditional rock alpine garden. And you'll see lots and lots of succulents in there, but, but no cactus, because this is made for plants from high elevations that like cool summers. Well, cool summers. You guys really beat us in the summer, but we were 103 last week, so we do have some pretty high temperatures there as well. Big difference though is we get down to minus 30 in the winter and I was really surprised to hear when we went on the tour yesterday that many of the gardens here get down to below freezing every single year. So you do share some of the cold um, issues that we deal with. But there's our traditional garden. Collecting tendencies created rock gardening and still drives it to this day as it does cactus and succulents. And so here are some of the plants that have made their appearance probably in the last decade or so in our area, in our gardens. And of course, you know the lines that you saw last night? We do that too when we have plant sales for the, for the Rock Garden Society as well. People will come and stand an hour in line to pay for their plants. So everybody's looking for something new, odd, and unusual. And how do we get these plants? We have Paniotti. Paniotti has traveled the world looking for plants. And he's been doing this for as long as I've lived in Denver for the past three decades. And he's joined by lots of other people. 
But see those bags on top of his car? Those are seeds. And we look, Randy was doing something in the garage, he's a good friend of ours, opened the door and he said, boy, I have to have a picture of that. Because <laughs> he couldn't even drive his car at that point in time. It became, I think it broke down, he was waiting for funds to fix it, so it became a carrier of seed bags. But this is what he's growing in his garden. He's experimenting constantly, so the lapidaria didn't survive all winter. We had a winter when it really did get to minus 30 and, and he lost that. But the other things you're seeing here all did survive the winter. And we're, we're really generalists. So you'll see he's growing orchids that are in a bog, created for it as well as the succulents that you see there. And if we didn't try these things, we would never know what would grow. He's been to South Africa and he's probably most well known for all of the ice plants that he's introduced for our area. Being a Californian by origin, my first thought was why would we want to grow ice plants? <laughs> Took me about 20 years before I finally caught the bug and now I'm growing ice plants as well. But this is the South African Plaza at Denver Botanic Gardens in all of its June just magnificence where you just have solid, solid sheets of color. And every time I see this, I think, why aren't people digging up their bluegrass lawns and putting this in instead? Because it's, that would give them so much more pleasure. So we have people like Bill Adams from Sunscapes. Probably some of you have ordered from him. And he's doing some crosses and some um, growing to try to create new color forms of things and they're making their way into the trade. Um, some of these have not turned out to be hardy for us, except for by microclimate, which I'll talk about more um, on Sunday. But these are some of the things that he had in his greenhouse the last time we visited. And then we also have the large cactus and succulent people like Kelly Grummans. He grows everything, he's a nurseryman, but he decided to take Okunches to a whole new level. So he's, he is going to have a new garden at Denver Botanic Gardens they'll be installing soon for re-blooming Opunches. That's one of the things he's breeding for. He's also breeding for spine coloration, for um, spineless, as well as the re-blooming. Um, you can see the Opuncha on the right blooming a second time in August. We don't tend to see the the same amount of bloom that time of year, but he's also breeding for hardy okunches with good fruit because, as you know, fruits are very good for making margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I would go through some of the myths because some of these things that we generally think about rock gardens have really changed. So the first one is rock gardeners grow only small alpine plants. They do grow those because rock gardeners like you want to have every plant known to man. I've always said if they went to the moon and they found a plant, I'd have my hand up. I want one of those. Moon dust they could keep, but I want the plant. So this is a rock garden and this is a woman who would call it a rock garden. And you can see there that it isn't just tiny little plants. We do have true alpines. This is at 14,000 feet, if you can read the, the marker there on Mount Evans. And these can be really, really difficult to grow in gardens. I've only seen the Claytonia in a couple of gardens locally, and it does not look like it does there. If you want to see these plants looking their best, they need to be where summers are cool and winters are cold, and that's hard to replicate in most climates. Denver's not one of them where we can. And I'm sure there's some people who are growing these, but you just don't see them very often. More often you see things like these. Again, these are things that we tend to emphasize cactus in our area over succulents, but there are hundreds of hardy succulents. And so that's changing too. We're starting to get more and more hardy succulents introduced and every rock gardener wants them. So you're seeing more and more of them. The other hens and chicks, I love that. It's a title I stole 
from an article that I found online, but we have these, these hens and chick forms. We used to say that rock gardeners, their first plant would be hens and chicks, and their last plant would be hens and chicks because they're so easy. But that's changed. They're, they're still pretty easy, but not all of them are. And we've also discovered that they really look good in rock gardens, so I can't imagine a rock garden without them now. We also have tiny cactus. You know, you guys have the big ones, but we have the ones that stay low and close to the ground so they can take our really cold winter temperatures. But we have quite a few of those to choose from as well. And there's not a rock gardener alive who doesn't see that at a sh show and sale and doesn't say, boy, I have to have that, if not all of them. And then more of the South Africans, they keep making more and more of them make our way every year and they get added into gardens. So in Colorado, rock gardens look like this. This is the Rock Alpine Garden at Denver Botanic Gardens. And it's not much like we started out with that you, there are elements in here that look like the one at Paniotti's house where they're all low, small, high alpine plants but it's become a real mix of things. And I think possibly that was Paniotti too, because I, when I moved to Colorado, it already looked like this. It was a real mix of shrubs and trees. We had lived in England before we came here, and Kew did not look like this. So I think this is a style that has been created out of the West. And I think we're all better off for it because we have so much more to choose from. The rock garden, this one is not a myth. The rock garden's primary objective is to make habitats to suit the plants they're growing. And this is, this is at Betty Ford Alpine Garden on the top. And that's a Raoulia that I really, really wanted to grow. So I asked them how they were growing it and they said they're growing it in pure sand. So that's my house, my garden in the lower right. And I came home and said, Randy, we gotta dig a place where we can put pure sand. So we dug up an area that was probably about a cubic yard out of our front flagstone lawn, um, replaced it with builder sand, planted the raulia, which of course promptly died. <laughs> but there's lots and lots of plants that like sand and so we still have a respectable number growing there. Though I still want that raulia. Another myth is that rock gardens always contain rocks. This is also Paniotti's garden. This is about an eighth of an acre where they did two parallel mounds on the right. And that is, I consider, a rock garden, even though there wasn't a rock in it. And I also consider Dan Johnson. He's in the back. This is his garden, the Water Smart Border at Denver Botanic Gardens and the top and the bottom, two pictures of that area. I consider that a rock garden. I'm not sure he does, but it has all the elements that you see in Paniotis on the right, which he does consider to be a rock garden. So why rocks? I think rocks are important to plant growth, especially when you're pushing the limits. This, Randy and I stopped to take pictures of penstemons, and you can see the blue flowers here, and he walked up here and I followed him. We found the pediocractus growing in these cracks. You very often, when we're traveling across the West and we're looking for cactus, we stop where we find rock mounds. And that's where we usually find the highest number of plants. And I just wanted to show you many plants growing on rock. This helps increase the hardiness. This is a, this Opuntia whiplii or Cylindro Puncha Whiplii is um, growing on a boulder that's about that large. And that helps protect the roots from freezing. So if it loses the top, you don't lose the whole plant. The rest of these you can see are growing either very next to rocks or in this case, growing on the rocks. So hardiness is affected quite a bit by having rocks. So if you're trying to increase the number of plants by growing things that are a little bit miffy for the range you're living in, this is the one of the ways that you can do it, is plant it next to a large boulder where the roots can get down next to the rocks. 
The other thing that rocks do is concentrate water. This is actually Split Rock, Wyoming. And when you stop there, this is where you find Luisia Reta Viva. In California, you'll find sheets of these things, but Wyoming's just that much drier. And so the, they take advantage of the little bit extra moisture that runs off of the rocks and into the cracks. And as I put on there, that can be the difference between life and death of the plant, where it can grow. Myth number three, raised beds. If you think of rock gardens, you always think of mounds and raised beds. And it's, they do have some real benefits, and I will not um, read them to you because they're, they're on that slide. But this is a typical rock garden here, where this is the level of the property, and then she created a rock garden where the, the uh, ground dropped off. And this is that same garden in bloom in June with Luisias. Now, if you're from a damp climate, then you really do want to consider using raised beds. These, these are two examples from Michigan and from the Netherlands, where they do grow cactus and succulent gardens. But they're using the tricks of extreme drainage um, in the soil, and also, in some cases, using the house eaves to cover to keep the water out. And also, by having a raised bed, some, most of the water will run off rather than um, go into the soil. So it might be necessary there. But here's a raised bed at Denver Botanic Gardens where we're really um, doing that just to showcase the plants. In this case, the having the plants up on a stage, you can see them more readily, especially when the plants are small than you can if they're all at ground level. And then you can go, this is Paniotis again. He has an extremely diverse garden. And this is a rock wall. I was delighted when he came back from one of his trips to show us this, this uh, Delasperma, which is right here, growing in nature. And in South Africa, it was growing on the rock walls exactly as he has it in his garden. So microclimates and macroclimates. We, we saw a good example of macroclimates yesterday in the garden tours with the a tourist garden, and I don't know if I'm um, saying his name correctly, but he can grow lots of plants that they can't grow in other parts of Phoenix because they don't get the winter freezes. It very seldom drops below freezing there. And so that's the compass orientation. That's your larger climate. But within the large climate, you have all of these tiny little areas where something different might grow because it's, it's a little warmer or a little cooler, depending on what the plant needs. And I put the snake in there because snakes are very, that's kind of what we're looking at. Reptiles are always looking for microclimates. So if you start thinking as if you were a snake and you need it warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer, That'll help you find your microclimates. That's a garter snake in my backyard. <laughs> we have rattlesnakes, but uh, we don't have any uh, in our backyard. At least I always check before I pick one up by accident. But um, so far, no rattlesnakes, even though they live within about two blocks of my house. And small changes can have a huge impact. So here's a Manfreda growing in a garden that Leo Chance takes care of near Pueblo. And I believe that it's the rocks, the microclimate was carefully chosen because that's not a plant that's terribly hardy for us. But it's been there for, gosh, almost 10 years. Myth number four, all cactus and succulents want to bake. And we heard that yesterday again at the uh, tourist garden. It's not true. And you need to find out what your plant wants and then cite it to where it wants to be or you will sunburn your plants. And I put on there one of the factors for us in Denver, UV light is 12% higher at Denver than at sea level. So for us, we, you'll see a lot of things growing in shade that you might choose sun depending on your climate. We also have started doing horizontal rock gardens where we are, so instead of the raised bed, because our issues is to keep things cooler in the summer and to keep more water in the soil because believe it or not, we get less rainfall than you do in Tucson. And so we are always trying to keep some of that moisture in the ground. Um, this, 
This one is at my house. And I also cited that because I wanted to grow alpines or alpine-like plants so that it's on the north side of some trees so it gets morning light and afternoon sun. And a lot of plants appreciate that. But this is another, this is a desert garden down in Franktown where it's also level and I expect her reason for doing that was to keep more moisture in the soil. But I saw this in Pueblo, which I thought was really interesting. In this case, see those steps? That goes down to the bottom of this. So it's quite a bit deeper. That's probably 10 feet into the ground. So it's kind of like the greenhouse we saw yesterday that was excavated into the ground, but without the structure over the top. And in this case, I think they were trying to keep it from their plants from the drying wind and also to give them a little bit more shade. Freestanding walls and fences can also shade, um, but you have to be careful because in a cold climate because they can also stop frost and create a frost pocket. That might be exactly what your plant wants, but if you're thinking you're getting a little more protection and you put something frost sensitive and it's on a slope and it gets, the frost gets trapped, you're actually um, doing something counterproductive. You can also use house walls. House walls are solid, usually the, the, the uh, behind the wall is heated, so they tend to stay warmer. And so this is a plant you don't see looking like this in Denver at a friend of mine's house, uh, Dara Bolander. Troughs are portable microclimates, and troughs are something what rock gardeners have always used. And these are containers um, usually now made out of hypertufa, and those sell as readily as our plants do at our sales. And they're especially good for tiny little cactus, like that Pediocactus noltoni. We were told that clump the size, each one the size of a fingernail was probably 100 years old. So if you're going to, and that is an endangered and rare plant, but it's in cultivation, you can buy it. But you probably don't want to put that in an open garden. You'd probably want to put that in a trough where you can actually see it because they're so tiny. And there it is in bloom, but that's not a bigger version. It's just a closer up photo. You can use other containers as well. We've started using ceramic containers because again, our, our focus is to keep more moisture in the pot in some cases, and hypertufa tends to dry out pretty fast. So some examples, that's actually with snow on there. And also wood containers are starting to show up, which is really fun. They eventually will decay and rot, but they make good, good containers. This was Kelly's, these were, these, this was Kelly Grumman's at his nursery that has since closed. And that's actually a hypertufa trough made with color. We're starting to see more and more unusual um, applications. This is one of my favorite pictures. We went to visit rock gardens in Portland, Oregon, and they have a horrible time keeping the damp off their plants. So this gentleman had planted all of his rock gardens in appliances, dead appliances. <laughs> and we asked him about it, and we asked him why he was doing that, and he said, well, every time it rains, I run out and close the lid. <laughs> But you can see what people go to in <laughs> Seattle. Almost all of their rock garden plants have these little plexiglass and glass structures. And then again in Holland in greenhouses. And a lot of things were grown in greenhouses in England and Europe. But we usually grow things outside here. You don't see too many greenhouses in Colorado because we don't need it. And when I was looking at photos of rock gardens, to prove that they don't just have to be in temperate climates. These, this is Arizona and California, and I think these are rock gardens, even though they're cactus gardens. They're, ca they're definitely a hybrid garden. Water restrictions have also made us even more careful with water. At, at my house, these are, these are all at my home. We have been on water restrictions since the year 2000. I'm allowed to water three times a week for 15 minutes. That's it. 
My water bill before I use any water looks, I should say, for 2,000 gallons of water, it's $80 a month, and it goes up hugely after that. This really starts to impact how much you water. You handed us out a, for our, a pamphlet on how to water um, here. We would not be allowed to use any of the things you're allowed to use here. So lawns are starting to go away. It's just too expensive to maintain them. And the water, um, we're being constantly told, please don't waste water. So a lot of us have started using, instead of the alpine gardens, which need more water, we've started going to more and more dry land plants. Fortunately, we have an area close to us where dry land plants thrive, and that's where we bring in a lot of our plants. This is Pawnee Buttes National Grassland, and this is an area where, boy, doesn't that look like the rock garden you saw at Paniotti's house? But this is a really harsh environment, and that's where the plants we like best occur. They, we like plants that occur where the winds are really strong, the sun is really strong, and the weather is really extreme. So it's not a bad thing. These are the plants that we like best. You get this, you get this amazing rounding when you get winds from all directions. That's what causes that. So more and more you're seeing unirrigated rock gardens, and these are at my house, and these are areas I don't water, or water very little. Uh, I live in a covenant-controlled community, so I will occasionally water in July just to keep things from going dormant. But this is in my backyard, so, you know. But I did find my house posted anonymously um, online, and it said, look, there's even a choya in this garden. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> so that's the front yard and that's the choya. <laughs> and I don't water this, uh, or I water it very little. I would not have to water it at all. But I do water it some just to keep, because our growing season is fairly short. And I don't want things to go dormant in the middle of, of July, because I'd like my neighbors to like this and do something similar and not say, wow, brown yard in July, not interested. This is another one. I'm going to show you several unirrigated rock gardens. This is Sandy Snyder's in Littleton, Colorado. And she won a national award as the best rock garden in the country a few years back. And my friend Dare, I showed you some pictures from his garden. Uh, here are a few more. It's one of the most beautiful gardens in Colorado that you'll never see because he's extremely shy and he doesn't open it to the public. I also think he thinks it's not quite up to snuff. What do you think? <laughs> Linda Bowley has a front yard in Boulder, and hers has an entirely different character because in these pictures you're seeing nothing but succulents. She grows no cactus. Um, I don't know if I saw any agaves in there either, but um, it's mostly just sedums and um, semps and delasperma and, and semp lookalikes. Leo Chance, you probably all know his book. I love his garden because it's just this mosaic of tiny little plants. So it's kind of got the look of a, of a lot rock garden with these accents of larger plants. It's just exquisite. Plus he grows things most of us just don't have much chance of succeeding with. So another myth, color spree our peaks in spring, it does with the traditional snow melt plants that you use in a traditional garden. These are things that are above tree line. The minute the snow melts, they jump into bloom. But we have other seasons as well. And so I want to look at something during the summer when our yuccas are in bloom, which they were in bloom when we left home, and the uh, cylindro punches as well. I also want things in autumn. I want something to look at all year round in my garden. Winter as well. And I think there's nothing better than a cactus and succulent garden in the winter. Because it's so sculptural. We have a few evergreen succulents and they're kind of our stock and trade for winter interests. And I love the way this domation has melted the snow there in that picture. 
We also traditionally have water features in rock gardens. And I think the, the drier the place you live, the more important a water feature is because a water feature makes people feel welcome. And I think gardens should always not just be a place for plants, but a place where people feel comfortable as well. And water does that. It can be very small. I had a waterfall before I was not allowed to have one anymore due to drought. And so now I have this little recirculating thing in my front flagstone. It's just a bucket with, re and I just have to fill that when I water the plants. Or in this case, this is Dares. He has two buckets recirculating. You could call that a desert sea if they're tiny. They're just five gallon buckets recirculating between the two. But it just gives you that sense of water, plus more microclimates for different plants. So building a rock garden, we'll go through this just briefly to give you an idea, this is not so difficult. This is our backyard that was all lawn when we started. We had a wedding in our backyard, so we left it. And then the day after the wedding, we went out and did that. <laughs> right there. <laughs> and uh, no more weddings, because that pretty much covers the entire backyard. Choosing a site, there's lots of places where rock gardens are the perfect choice because they can feature small plants and fit in small places where it's really hard to grow other plants. This is a good example. This is actually a large spot, but it's a acre. This property is over an acre, and she had a back hillside. You couldn't see from the house. It was just connected to a little um, road off to the side, and she just and it was also very hot. And she thought perfect place for a cactus garden and it's it's a really beautiful garden so insider tip this is my advice to you because I'm the one who breaks all these rules that's my garden that's my garden that's my garden don't put your rock garden under trees that drop needles or leaves because I spend probably more hours on my hands and knees cleaning up after the mess, I tried covering this one last year just to keep the pine needles out of it because that's that little one that you saw that's full of small plants. Also, don't put large cactus where you're going to shovel snow. We did that last year. <laughs> All our choices were just flat to the ground by the because we did have a snowy winter last year. Snow doesn't contain a lot of water. You might think that it does, but it doesn't. But it does smash plants effectively. Okay. Soils, do you amend or not? You gotta look at where plants grow in nature. And um, we've got this idea, I'm sure you guys are not guilty of this, but it's amazing how many people still say, I have really bad soil. No, you don't. You just haven't picked the right plant. Unless your soil has herbicides in it, or oil, which is an effective herbicide, or heavy in salts, you don't have a bad soil. You've just you're trying to grow tomatoes in that, and it's not going to work. So you can amend soil. Um, this is Kendrick Lake Park, and they're they're open to the public. It is not a um, there's no fee. You just park and walk in there, and they have absolutely magnificent specimens. Apparently, people in Colorado don't steal cactus because they they've been there for years and years. But they amended the whole place and here. And this is what they amended it with. This is the soil mix that they used. I would recommend that you uh, recommend that you amend lightly. Don't go through with and do your whole property because then you've just eliminated soil microclimates, which you want to expand your plant palette. So here this, there's some more pictures of Kendrick Lake and the things thriving on that soil. They started out with a clay loam, was their original soil that they used as a base. This is Timberline Gardens using exactly the same soil mix because they recommended the soil that um, they used in the previous garden, and these are plants growing on that soil. But this is his Okuncha garden, and this was the one he's become most famous for. When they bought the nursery, this area here was where they had dumped all the soil that, that was left over at the end of the season, all the soil that was in pots. It was just their dump. Everything got dumped there. 
And he didn't want to spend the time amending it or doing anything with it, so he planted it with opunchas. And it's the most, that's the garden they became famous for. So no amending and the worst soil known to me. And this was Don, is Don Campbell's creation in Grand Junction. He had salts in his soils. So he used landscape cloth below, um, right at ground level, and then built up on top of it to try to prevent the, the salts from making their way up into the garden. And it is also a magnificent garden. So there's just not one right way to do this. Rock choices, they're just as many rock choices as there are rocks. If you want to follow traditional design advice, choose one rock and use it throughout the area you're doing. This is Kelly Grumman's garden at home, where he's done that with volcanic boulders. But rules are meant to be broken. Um, look at the mix of rocks. This is a person who really likes to collect rocks. This person inherited a bunch of rocks from a geologist. They look so good in the garden. So why, why wouldn't you just break the rules if you want to? Rock alternatives. This whole garden here in Holland is created with concrete. Those are broken sidewalks, created it into a large sphere. This is hypertufa done in the ground. She said she couldn't afford rocks. So she made this concrete mix and made her own rocks in the ground. I love these, col these are culvert liners. He said it cost them thousands of dollars to have them cut in half, so I'm not sure I'd recommend that one. <laughs> but that was at a botanic gardens. And then this is what we saw at Jim Bishop's house in California using old um, drain, drain pipes and bottles. You can use anything that you fancy. Arranging rocks too. You can find all sorts of ways of arranging rocks. There are Asian techniques that you can read about that are quite traditional. Or you can just start setting out your rocks any way you like them. One of the ways that you can have it not look too odd is to look at nature, observe nature, take some pictures and bring it home and copy it. So this is at Denver Botanic Gardens again and this garden was based, it's a shale garden for rare plants and it was based on this is in Pueblo, that's the natural, that's the recreated. But you don't have to. These are not hardy succulents, but I saw that in Holland planted on shale done in stylized planting. It is entirely up to you how you want to do this. But what you do want to do is keep it safe. And here are some ideas to follow. And I said, this is online. When you're setting the rocks, start at the base of the hill if you're doing a hill. Whatever you're doing, do the large ones first. Set those first. You want to bury every rock, one, it says two-thirds, but you sometimes will bury it even more deeply than that. You want to be able to stand on a rock, it should not move, because you don't want to be the one that breaks your ankle gardening and when, it, when your own rock tips over on you, and they will. <laughs> so, um, I, if you want it to look natural, space it in uneven triangles, not um, evenly, and follow the strata. This rock doesn't have much of a strata, but some rocks do. I think in this case, instead of strata, they followed the fracture lines. This is a, a, the, when the rocks were dumped. This is when they started building it. And this is as the rocks are placed and finished before it's planted. And here's where they filled this area with the flagstone walk. That's a public garden, so they wanted a wide walk. We're also seeing a lot of crevice gardens. That's become extremely popular in our area. And some few different types of examples. This is Raven Ranch in Franktown, and that's what she's growing in that, that rock pile. She calls it her Utah garden. And here we are at uh, the Rock Alpine Garden at Denver Botanic Gardens Crevice Garden. And here is Apex. This has become one of our most famous gardens. Things grow in here like you just would not believe. This plant had been subjected the previous day to an extremely bad hailstorm. This is another example of how rocks, you can see how this is a really rocky environment and this is planted in over here. That protected it from hail because delospermas do not withstand hail. Paz built those in at the same time. This is my house. I like using 
a path to collect water and the direct water. We used permaculture at our house and also the uh, dry stream bed, which looks very good with, um, I think, in our region. And Dan, and you saw his gardens at Denver Botanic Gardens. That's his garden at home, another one of the most beautiful gardens you've ever seen. Stairs, you want to build those in at the same time. There's Dan's stairs. These are my stairs. Um, this is at Vale Alpine Garden. I love that they have to have handicapped access, so they put two sets of stair of paths in so they could do these made out of rock. Mulch, I put reasons why you might want to use mulch. You can use just about anything. At my house I use marbles and glass. This is from Dear, um, Dear Bollander again. I asked him where he got this little mulch that's in here with this rock. And he said, well, when I bought the rock, I said, can I sweep under the pallet? And the rock yard said, sure. So he has the mulch that exactly matches it. Or if you're collecting in the wild, like that one, she just takes buckets with her and collects mulch at the same time. This is Paniotes, and this is my favorite that I wish I'd known about when I built mine. We're walking and talking, and he's talking about plants, and he's reaching down and scooping up gravel and throwing it up the hill. He stores his gravel exactly the same that's on his gardens in his walks. And so every time they have it delivered, they just dump it right there, and it's right there where they need it. Plant selection. Randy took this from the bulletin where the fun begins. Um, it's essential to match the conditions of the plant. Whatever microclimates you have, identify them, and then group the plants together, just as you would in a vegetable garden. And it's not always intuitive what a plant wants. Lewisius don't all come from the same places. They don't all have the same needs, but we have the internet. It's really easy now to look up where a plant comes from and then extrapolate to your own property. Plant placement, um, Dan, look away, but I thought that really was not a good place for that plant. <laughs> I mean, I look at that and I think, you don't want the largest plant at the peak of the hill. I would trade these two. I would put that one there and that one there. But again, that's arbitrary, unless it's affecting the plant's growth and conditions. And we're finishing up with Dan Johnson because Art in the rock garden is also something I, could, I have done an entire talk about because this is fairly new too and I was so pleased to see art in every garden we visited yesterday. I think art and gardens are just a natural mix and so I have a couple of images of his garden which has almost as much art in it as it does plants. It's um, just so much fun. Children love gardens like these. Adults go from plant to plant, but children go from art piece to art piece, especially the small and hidden ones. So just to prove that there is a crossover and a, a revolution happening, this is the Rock Garden quarterly cover from spring 2019. And you might expect that would be the cover you'd find I mean, I'm sorry, 2016, thank you. <laughs> it's coming up and, and, and I'm prescient. <laughs> so for more information at the, actually on the website, we, I listed quite a few more um, books and places that you can go to find out about rock gardening. We have an excellent rock garden website with NARGS, which is the addresses on there. But you know, rock gardening has also become mainstream, and places like Rockstar Plants, these are branded plants, they have the most magnificent websites because they have the money to put these things together. So all you need to do is Google rock gardens and you'll find several others, but that was one that I thought was an especially good one. So you have no excuse now to not, if you wanna, I saw lots and lots of big plants with just raked, leave them. But if you're going to grow small plants, then you might want to give some of these rock gardening ideas a try because they will help you um, to both to, to stage the plants and also to keep them happy. So thank you all very much.